on World News Tonight. Battling the Blades. Rescue efforts tirelessly pick up the pace in Hawaii on battling what is now claimed to be the deadliest U.S. wildfires in a century. Lethal collapse. Dozens remain under rubble following landslides in India's Himachal Pradesh. Warning shots. Russia fires at merchant ships in the Black Sea in its first hostile actions away from Ukrainian soil. And race to the finish. India's Kerala sees the attendance of thousands of boat enthusiasts for their famous trophy snake boat race. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are watching World News. We're starting off tonight in a grief-stricken Hawaii as the U.S. state encountered the deadliest wildfires in a century. The fires that are sweeping through the island of Maui are already the deadliest U.S. wildfires in more than 100 years. This is the largest natural disaster we've ever experienced. It's going to also be a natural disaster that's going to take an incredible amount of time to recover from. The Maui chief of police, John Pelletier, said at least 93 people have been killed as of last Saturday in the town of Lahaina. He added that the number of fatalities is going to climb as the rescue teams have only searched 3% of the damaged area. Families are still looking for their loved ones. I cannot describe what my feeling right now. So it's all, 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 I can feel it underneath me. So, so, so when I see the Lahaina, uh, Lahaina town itself, I cannot describe how, how. No, hard feelings, I guess. The wildfires that started last Tuesday have destroyed at least 2,000 structures, predominantly residential buildings. Strong winds last week made it difficult to extinguish the flames. As the flames die down, search and identification processes will continue using DNA testing and dental records to identify the victims. Temporary housing and rescue efforts will be the priority for recovery as more relief is starting to arrive. If you look at the turnout today, it's amazing. The whole island's coming together. I got people on the mainland like donating and sending money and stuff and doing whatever they can. So if we keep this up, it should be the best we can, we can make it. Could be worse. The federal government is deploying more than 250 federal emergency management agency personnel. But with road travel restricted, delivery of necessities has been difficult. Now, climate emergencies are currently occurring across the globe. As wildfires tore through Hawaii, both eastern China and Russia were struck by severe downpours. Meanwhile, new reports of more wildfires come from Bolivia's Santa Cruz. Chinese state media reported that a tornado and hailstorm killed at least two people and injured 15 in Jiangsu province. The storm struck in the afternoon near Yangcheng City, a few hours' drive north of China's financial capital, Shanghai. Similarly, extreme weather cast upon Moscow as well. The country's emergencies ministry said the situation led task forces to oversee the cleanup of parts of the Russian Far East after Typhoon Kanun swept through the primary region. Russia's state-owned TASS news agency cited the ministry as saying nearly 4,400 homes and multiple apartment buildings were flooded, with 28 settlements still cut off from access. It is said most of the affected homes were in the cities of Usirsk and Spask Dalny and in the Oktyabrsk Municipal Council, in the region of Primori where the port of Vladivostok is the administrative center. TASS reported no casualties but added the flood in Usirsk, the second largest city in Primori, was the worst and biggest in a decade, with up to 40% of its territory affected. In the midst of these downpours, aerial images showed firefighters battling a blaze that burned down grasslands in Santa Cruz, eastern Bolivia. According to information shared by the government, 13,907 hotspots have been registered in the department in this month alone. Authorities also reported that as of Saturday, 20 incidents of forest fires, 89 incidents of interference fires and one structural fire has been managed. With climate change becoming an increasingly alarming issue worldwide, questions remain on the effectiveness of currently present strategies in battling future weather threats. 
Now over in India, at least 20 people have died and dozens more feared trapped after an ancient Hindu temple collapsed in the northern state of Himachal Pradesh due to heavy rains. Rescue operations are underway after the temple in a popular tourist town of Shimla was hit by a landslide. Himachal Pradesh has received heavy rain over the past few days, triggering floods and landslides. 21 people have died in the past 24 hours in rain-related incidents. The state's chief minister, Sudhir Singh Sukhu, who is at the site of the landslide, said that around 20 to 25 people may still be trapped under the debris. Thousands of tourists visit the hill state of Himachal Pradesh, especially its capital Shimla, around the year to enjoy its cool weather and picturesque scenery. But the state has been experiencing heavy rains during the monsoon season, leading to flooding, landslides and cloud bursts, which cause further damage. Videos shared on social media over the past few days show vehicles and buildings being swept away by gushing rivers, trees falling on cars and tourists stranded due to road closures. Mr. Suku has appealed to the people in the state to stay indoors due to these rains. Rising tensions between China and Taiwan were once again apparent as China condemned a brief U.S. visit by Taiwan Vice President William Lai, saying he was a separatist and a troublemaker through and through. China on Sunday reacted in anger to a brief U.S. visit by Taiwan's Vice President William Lai, saying he was a separatist and, quote, troublemaker through and through. Lai, who arrived in New York on Saturday, is a frontrunner to be Taiwan's next president. China claims democratically governed Taiwan as its own territory. Beijing's foreign ministry said it opposed any kind of visit by Taiwan independent separatists to the United States. Taipei responded saying China was the real troublemaker, pointing to its standoff this month with the Philippines and its continued military harassment of Taiwan. A person familiar with the trip's planning said Lai was not planning to meet with U.S. lawmakers. Taipei and Washington call the U.S. stopovers routine and no cause for China to take provocative actions. China is likely to launch military drills this week near Taiwan, using Lai's stopovers as a pretext to intimidate voters ahead of January's election and make them fear war, according to Taiwanese officials. Lai's visits come as Beijing and Washington are trying to improve relations. That includes the prospect of a visit to the U.S. by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, which could pave the way for a meeting between U.S. President Joe Biden and China's leader Xi Jinping later this year. Moving on to Russia's aggression in the Black Sea, a Russian naval ship forcibly stopped and inspected a cargo ship heading for the Ukrainian port and fired warning shots to forcibly stop the vessel. This comes as Ukraine's firefighters battled a large blaze in Odessa after what Ukrainian authorities described as overnight Russian drone and missile attacks on the port city. A Russian warship fired warning shots at this cargo ship in the southwestern Black Sea on Sunday as it made its way northwards. It was the first time Russia has fired on merchant shipping beyond Ukraine since it quit a landmark UN-brokered grain deal last month. The deal allowed Ukraine to export agricultural produce via the Black Sea. After leaving it, Moscow said it would view all ships heading to Ukrainian waters as potentially carrying weapons. Russia said in a statement... One of its patrol ships had fired automatic weapons on the Palau-flagged Shukru Okan after the ship's captain failed to respond to a request to halt for an inspection. Russia said the vessel was making its way towards the Ukrainian port of Ismail. Refinitiv shipping data showed the ship was currently near the coast of Bulgaria and heading towards the Romanian port of Sulina. Firing on a merchant vessel will ratchet up already acute concerns among ship owners, insurers and commodity traders about the potential dangers of getting ensnared in the Black Sea. The Russian military boarded the vessel with the help of a helicopter, Russia's defence ministry said. After an inspection, the ship carried on its way. Reuters could not immediately reach the vessel or its owners for comment. Since Russia left the Black Sea grain deal, both Moscow and Kiev have issued warnings and carried out attacks that have sent jitters through the global commodity, oil and shipping markets. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side.
joins now on tonight's segment on the road to the White House, where Ron DeSantis simply couldn't escape the shadow of the former president as Trump continues to lead polls against his GOP rivals, even at a time where a possible fourth indictment looms. Today, Donald Trump and his closest rival, Ron DeSantis, facing off at one of the most crucial you. political litmus tests, the Iowa State Fair. Yeah. The Florida governor, still struggling to chip away at Trump's commanding lead, was heckled on stage. Talk to me about what you're hearing um, and seeing across Iowa. A plane over the fairgrounds, even flying a banner teasing, be likable, Ron. And as DeSantis stopped to flip pork chops and burgers, voters chanted for his opponent. Trump today making it personal, arriving with Florida Republicans who support him over their own governor. Governor DeSantis is more like-minded where I think he can bring the United States together as a people. We don't need division and that's kind of what Trump does right now. The former president now bracing for a possible fourth indictment in Georgia and could be on trial in a separate case starting January 2nd, two weeks before the Iowa caucuses. Trump has denied any wrongdoing. Trump leads DeSantis in Iowa by 24 points, according to a recent New York Times Siena College poll. No other candidate has double digit support, including former Vice President Mike Pence, still challenged by voters about certifying the 2020 election on January 6th. When the leaders of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan gather at Camp David, they will be aiming to build and polish up a trilateral cooperative mechanism to tackle North Korea and other regional challenges. South Korea, the United States and Japan will establish a trilateral system for multi-layered cooperation to face security and economic challenges in the Indo-Pacific region jointly. That's according to Seoul's Deputy National Security Advisor ahead of the Camp David talks this Friday between Presidents Yoon suk Joe Biden and Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. Gathering at the secluded presidential venue, the leaders will focus on institutionalizing a distinctive mechanism for cooperation. The leaders are set to discuss the common vision and basic principles for trilateral cooperation and establish a comprehensive and multi-layered cooperation system in various fields and at all levels. On security, the leaders will look to further strengthen their joint response to common threats in the region, namely North Korea's growing nuclear and missile capabilities with practical military measures. U.S. Ambassador to Japan Ram Emanuel said last week that the joint statement would feature the regularization of top-level meetings to at least once a year, annual joint military training, along with intel sharing and cyber cooperation to deter North Korea. A senior UN official said the leaders' discussion will have the final word on such details and that the format of the semantics of the trilateral body are being ironed out. Another key agenda item is cooperating to procure economic security with talks on supply chains, energy and advanced technologies. With the trilateral framework to strengthen their policy coordination on various issues, the trio also plan to join forces with other regional players like the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to ensure freedom, peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. With the focus on cooperation, the senior official said the leaders won't discuss Japan's release of Fukushima wastewater and their joint statement is unlikely to include strong words on China. The Camp David meeting is the first ever standalone summit to be held by the three countries. Their dialogues began in 1994 and were always held on the sidelines of other international events. Their talks on Friday add further momentum to fast improving relations between Seoul and Tokyo after the neighbours fully restored bilateral trade and intel sharing in recent months. Seoul says bilateral summits are also likely to take place after a luncheon and a joint press conference at Camp David. Now, to grapple with the influx of migrant crossings, the UK government has made stopping the boats one of its five priorities. However, now the UK ministers are facing renewed pressure to tackle boat crossings in the Channel after six migrants died when a vessel sank off the French coast. Turbulent waters in the Channel and in government. As more migrants are processed in Dover a day after six drowned. Now, renewed pressure cross-party and from charities amid accusations immigration policies are failing. This is the, the end of a really long journey for most people. You know, it's the last hurdle, if you will. They've been through unimaginable experiences to get here. They're not going to be deterred. 
Here are five things I'm doing to stop the boats. At the start of the week, the Prime Minister publicised strategy. You can't stay, no matter how hard you try. But days later, a milestone. Numbers crossing the channel in small boats topped 100,000 in five years. The government have been stopping boats. There are record numbers of people arriving in Europe at the moment. Um, but the actual numbers coming from France into the United Kingdom have gone down. There's a lot of work that's been undertaken to achieve that. We're working very closely with the French government now to stop boats being launched. Obviously, we haven't stopped them all. It's going to continue to be a problem, but we have stopped a lot. Shame on you! Opposition to the Bibby Stockholm barge continues after its evacuation over health concerns at the end of the government's small boats week, described as a catalogue of chaos. What we get increasingly from the Conservatives is gimmicks and headlines. That is not the answer, and I think the British people deserve a lot better than these ridiculous, ludicrous and increasingly um, you know, unworkable schemes. The six who drowned were among more than 60 aboard a boat, with fears traffickers may be trying to transport as many as possible while weather's favourable. As the Dover lifeboat carries out exercises, readiness is crucial. Over 1,600 have made it across in three days. More are on their way, resolute whatever the cost. In a surprising turn of events, Argentine voters punished the country's two main political forces in a primary election, pushing a rock-singing libertarian outsider candidate known as Javier Milei or La Peluca into first place in a huge shake-up in the race towards presidential elections. Smiles and hugs for a political outsider who's just lit up Argentina's election race. Javier Milei laps up the applause knowing that he is now one of the favourites to rule the country. They call him La Peluca, or the wig, for his wild hair. Rock anthems always provide the soundtrack to his rallies. The former singer of a Rolling Stones tribute band, an economics professor, promises radical change. In a country where two political forces have ruled for decades, people are sick of the cost of living crisis. It doesn't matter whether it is good or bad manners. Enough of the fallacy of discussing form. Let's discuss content, the content that you don't want and that we have plenty of. I, therefore, invite Argentinians to join the liberal revolution that will make Argentina a world power again in 35 years. The so-called Mileistas, supporters of Millet, say he's offering something completely different. He's flattered to be called an Argentinian Donald Trump or Jair Bolsonaro. Critics say his credentials are straight from anti-establishment central casting. A long-time political chat show guest draws a crowd wherever he goes. He opposes abortion, denies the existence of global warming and calls Argentina a tax hell, pledging a rapid reduction in government spending and changing the currency to the dollar. Elections are two months away. The primaries reflect the anger of the political system. The current president, Alberto Fernandez, is standing down, blamed for the failure to tackle the economic crisis and spiralling inflation. Many Argentinians prepared to gamble on the unpredictable, disillusioned by the tried and tested. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The curtain officially came down on the 25th World Scout Jamboree with over 40,000 scouts from all around the world reuniting in Seoul at a grand K-pop concert. Mount Etna, the most active volcano in Europe, illuminated the night sky with a breathtaking display of eruptions. Perched above the Sicilian town of Catania, Mount Etna frequently erupts, yet its outbursts seldom result in significant damage. Niger Junta said they had gathered enough evidence to prosecute ousted President Mohamed Bazoum for high treason following his imprisonment last month and Niger's military subsequent dissolving of the elected government. A holy shrine in Iran's southern city of Shiraz has come under a second deadly attack in less than a year with gunmen breaking into its grounds and opening fire, killing at least one person and wounding several others. Cantos unveiled plans for some aircrafts to carry special libraries supporting the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia's constitution, stepping into the divisive debate on Indigenous rights.
And that is all we have for you tonight on World News. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight as tens of thousands of people throng to the town in Alfusa in India's Kerala state to see the famous Nehru Trophy boat race. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.